My name is, uh, is Michael King. I'm a finance professor at Ivy Business School. I'm the uh, Tangerine Chair in Finance. And, and you are, in fact, in the Tangerine Leadership Center. Um, through the uh, generous gift that we have from Tangerine, we're able to host uh, an annual lecture which is trying to look at a topic that's very innovative or on the cutting edge of finance. And uh, tonight, we have Professor Terry O'Dean, who's come all the way from uh, California, from UC Berkeley, a high school who doesn't. Um, Terry is, I think, between his undergrad and then his years of uh, years on the faculty at uh, UC Berkeley, like you're, you're really Berkeley through and through. <laughs> Uh, apart from a short stint after doing his uh, PhD at Berkeley at another uh, California university, he, he has been at, at Berkeley where he is now um, a full professor. And when he was starting to do his PhD thesis, there was really no field of behavioral finance. So uh, what we now know is sort of much more mainstream with, uh, obviously, with um, Nobel Prizes for um, Danny Kahneman and then also um, uh, post posthumously for Amos Tversky, and, and then you will have seen books recently about thinking fast, thinking slow. It's become very, very uh, popular, and the behavioral biases of investors are much more widely accepted, but for decades, that was not the case. So you really had to be a believer and an outsider in order to push this agenda, in order to now be able to stand on the center stage um, in the field of finance. Uh, and Terry is one of those people who really blazed, blazed the trail. He is published in the highest uh, level of academic journals in both finance and economics, uh, including the Journal of Finance and the American Economic Review. Um, he has um, uh, taught not only at uh, Berkeley, but has been guest lecturer in many universities around the world. He's got YouTube videos on um, explaining finance, and he's often sought after by the press. So we are very, very happy to have Terry here today. I, I will let him tell you more, but the plan is for him to give his talk, to have Q&A, and to wrap up by 7 a.m. Uh, 7 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so please welcome Terry. Uh, Benjamin Graham once said that the investor's chief problem, even his worst enemy, is likely to be himself. And I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about some things that individual investors do that make them their own worst enemies. But first, I, I, first I wanted to tell you why I think finance is harder than accounting. Do we have any accountants? There must be some accountants. All right. Got a couple of uh, uh, accountants. Well, the thing is, to be an accountant, you have to be able to add and subtract. But to really understand finance, you have to understand probability. And it turns out human beings have a good grasp of quantities, a good intuitive grasp, but we really struggle with probability. So let me give you an example. 2 plus 2. Everybody knows what 2 plus 2 is, right? <laughs> Little kids know what 2 plus 2 is. And there's some exceptions. <laughs> if you ask an accountant what's 2 plus 2, he's likely to reply, well, what do you need it to be? <laughs> but, but the rest of us would probably agree. Two plus two is, is four. All right, so that's a little addition problem. Let me give you a little probability problem. If I flip two coins, what's the probability that they both come up head? That's right, 25%, just like that. Can't be too hard. All right, now I'm going to make these problems a little harder. Two plus two plus two plus two. Anybody get it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just look at it. You're not even going, just, okay, yeah. Now, what if I make the probability problem a little hard? Instead of flipping two coins, I'm going to flip four coins. My question is, what's the probability that any three of them come up heads and the other one comes up tails? I don't care about the order. I see Amos back there trying to calculate it. Um, by the way, that's the technical high point of this talk. <laughs> it took me three hours on an airplane to figure out how to make um, this is this was involved. I took little video clips that were green screened. And anyway, <laughs> how many of you don't get don't shot on that yet? How many of you are pretty sure you know the probability that any three or four coins come up heads? Are you including the case where they all four come? <clears throat> no, any three. No, one tail and three heads. 
and Newport Harbor. Yeah. Well, well, we'll agree it's not as easy, right? In fact, I gave a talk at Google the day before Google went public. And I, I gave this example. Uh, my job, as it was explained to, to me, was, was indirectly to try to nudge people in the direction of not blowing the fortune they were about to make, um, you know, to, to invest wisely. But when I did this, there were about 200 engineers, it was software engineers in the room, and about 20 of them knew the answer. And I asked them if they had ever taken a class in permutations and combinations. They all said, yeah, right, that's why we know the answer. And then I looked at the rest of the room and said, well, what about you guys? And people said, well, that was a long time ago. You know, I mean, I don't remember everything. So it, it turns out, you know, yes, human beings deal with probability. And we can learn. You can get training. And if you've had training recently and you use it, you can answer questions like this. But mostly we don't know how. So we use, now you might say, OK, people don't formally know how, but they probably get about the right answer. Now, I, I haven't done this. Study. I actually would like to, but when my youngest daughter was in junior high school, she did a little project where she went down to a local coffee, a Pete's coffee shop on a Sunday morning and asked people the probabilities of three coin combinations and then brought it all back and I helped her analyze it. The answers were all over the place. There was absolutely no convergence towards you know, the right answers. What we end up doing is we use mental shortcuts, sometimes called heuristics, to deal with probability. And sometimes these work well, but they also sometimes have systematic predictable biases. Uh, OK, let's see what, what a mental shortcut might be like. Suppose um, I was to ask you to think of a US company that went public since 2000 that has been really successful. Well, chances are, especially given what I just talked about, some of you would think of Google, even if I had to mention Google. It comes to mind easily every day you know, when you look at your, uh, you, know, you do a Google search, you use, use your Gmail. Now, suppose I ask you to think of a US company that went public since 2000 that is now delisted and bankrupt. Is it easier to think of a company that was wildly successful or a company that was unsuccessful? In Canada, we know the really unsuccessful ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the US, mostly people, here's what you know in the US. You know the dramatic failures. You know about Enron. You know about WorldCom. But you don't know about the companies that sort of just failed slowly and faded away. They don't get remembered. So why, and one of the ways that people judge probability, this is from uh, Danny Kahneman's work. When I was an undergrad, I studied with a professor, a psychology professor named Danny Kahneman. And he's how I ended up in finance. I wanted to get a PhD in psychology. I went to his house one morning uh, to talk about grad school. And I left his house planning to apply for a PhD in finance, even though I walked in thinking I was going to be a psychologist. So he convinced me I should go into finance. And Danny later uh, won, won the Nobel Prize. He wrote a great book. If you guys are, if, if any of you find this intriguing enough that you'd like to read a 500 page book, which is well written, Thinking Fast and Slow. And um, Amos Tversky, his uh, research partner, and Danny um, studied a lot of these uh, <laughs> Heuristics. And this one's called the availability. The idea is that we judge probab one way we judge probabilities is by how easily examples come to mind. Now, why might this matter for an investor? Well, suppose an individual investor is thinking about buying an, a high-tech IPO. And he says to himself, well, you know, how likely is this to be successful? And he starts thinking about Google and Facebook and Apple and back to Microsoft. And he's thinking about the major success stories. And then he says to himself, well, how often did these things fail? He thinks, well, you know, Facebook had a couple bad days, but boy, it really bounced back. And then finally he says, I don't know, pets.com, that company's not around anymore, right? But the failures don't come to mind as easily. He's likely to overestimate the probability that this is going to be a success, that he'll make money. All right, so I want to talk about investors today. Um, 
Mostly I'll talk about what we know about investor behavior, and then at the end I want to talk briefly about why does it matter and what can investors do. So there are a number of uh, biases that investors have, basically. These are biases that they you know, share with others. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a few of them and how they, how they affect investor behavior. And the first one is basically just an, a, a misunderstanding of probability. So many investors are under-diversified. Not all. You know, investors that buy a broad-based index funds are like, snap, they're diversified. But investors who are buying individual stocks often are under-diversified. Now, I give a talk. This happens whenever there's a bear market. This was a few years back. But uh, I gave a talk, and um, a, there were financial advisors there. And remember, one of them raised, they said, oh, you. You academics are always talking about diversification. Bill Gates didn't get to be where he is today by diversifying. And that is true. If you hold a well-diversified portfolio, you will never be as wealthy as Bill Gates. Of course, if you hold an undiversified portfolio, you will never be as wealthy as Bill Gates. But you could end up as poor as the Enron employees who had all of their retirement savings in Enron stock. And when the company went belly up, they lost their life savings as well as their jobs. So I think that one problem that, you know, one big error that many, but not all investors make, is to be under-diversified. And I really think it's a lack of understanding. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about overconfidence. I, when I was a PhD student, I, the first paper I ever wrote was a theoretical paper about what happens in markets if people are overconfident if investors think they know more than they do. Um, and the example I use to try to get this sense of what do I mean by overconfidence across to my students is I'll, I'll pass out a little questionnaire and it reads like this. It says, look around the room at the other people in the room, many of whom you don't know, and rate how good of a driver you think you are compared to these other students. And typically, a quarter of the class rates themselves in the top 10%. And half the class rates themselves in the top 25%, and all but one or two students rate themselves above average. And sometimes after, you know, after doing this and getting the results, I'll ask uh, one of the students who rated him or herself average or below why. And my favorite answer was several years ago, a student had rated herself average, and I asked her why. She said, well, I was going to put myself you know, in the top quarter, and I thought about it, and I realized in the last year, I've gotten three speeding tickets. I've caused two traffic accidents. <laughs> and I have to go to court next month, or else they're going to suspend my license. No, I guess I'm just average. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the rest of us are above average. So what happens if investors think they have more ability than they do? Well, in a theoretical setting, they trade more, because they think they know more than they do. They earn less, because they don't know more than they do. Uh, they tend to under-diversify because when you're sure you're right, why hedge? And the market volatility goes up. So I wrote this, uh, this theory paper and uh, as a PhD student, and I, I realized that nobody was going to go up and test my brand new theory except for me. And I was able to obtain trading records of the, the trades, the accounts of individual investors. And the first study I did was very simple. I just wanted to show that these investors were trading too much. And I found that before taking commissions and spreads into consideration, on average, when one of these investors sold one stock and bought another, the stock that he or she sold went on to do better than the one that they bought. So that's clearly not your objective. And then I did various things to try to exclude non-speculative trades, and it even got to be a stronger effect. Then I got a second data set and started working with my friend, uh, Brad Barber. And we asked the question, we said, okay, the theory says, the theoretical paper says overconfident investors are going to trade more and earn less. Let's just see whether people who are trading more are earning less. So we looked at 60, I think it was 66,000 investors uh, who were trading common stocks. We 
broke them up into five groups based on how actively they were trading, and we calculated the average annual net return for each of these <coughs> groups. This was from 91 through 96 with the data set. And uh, this, in this study, we were actually taking out the commissions, and our data set gave us explicitly what the commissions were that people had paid. What did we find? Well, we find that, found that the, these are the um, buy and hold investors. Uh, let's see. And this is what they're earning. This is how much they're trading. And here are the most active investors. The green is how actively they're trading, and the blue is what they're earning. The buy and hold investors were outperforming the most active investors by six to seven percentage points a year, which is why we actually titled our paper, Trading is Hazardous to Your Wealth. Now, I want to do another study. I, actually, an ideal study. This was pretty good. But in an ideal study, you would get a large group of investors, and you would separate them into those who are on average more overconfident and less overconfident. And there's a clear prediction, if, if the theory is right, which is the overconfident investors are going to trade more, and they're going to earn less because of it. It's going to hurt their returns. Well, we didn't have any way to go out and administer psychometric tests of overconfidence to tens of thousands of investors. That, that could change, you know, research is changing, but at the time I had no way of doing that. So, based, but we did have a lot of demographic information for about 30, 33,000 investors. And based on our reading of the site literature as well as some anecdotal observation, we realized that on average, men and women differ in the, their degree of overconfidence. And what will probably shock some of you is to find out that it's actually men who tend to be more overconfident. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone's as shocked, but uh, that, that, that men tend to be overconfident, display more overconfidence, particularly in areas such as you know, mathematical sciences, finance, things like that. So this gave us a prediction uh, for you know thirty some thousand accounts. We knew the gender of the person who would open up the account. We also knew whether these people were married or not. And we said to ourselves, okay, our prediction is that men are going to trade more actively than women, and that that trading is going to hurt their return. And we also thought the effect would probably be bigger for single men and women than married men and women, in part because there might be some influence back and forth, and in part because we knew that we knew who had opened the account, but that didn't necessarily mean that that was the person you know, trading the account. Well, what did we find? We found that men traded 45% more actively than women. Single men traded 67% more actively than uh, single women. On the return side, we did a bunch of different risk-adjusted returns. We did found the French alphas and stuff. But really, the most pertinent analysis was this. We wanted to know what the effect of trading was on people's portfolio performance. So we took a look at what each investor owned at the beginning of the year, and we calculated what that investor would have earned that year if he or she had never not traded at all, just buy and hold. Then we calculated what that investor actually earned. And we subtracted the buy and hold return from the actual return. And this gave us a measure of how, how much trading had affected them. Well, given why just told you what I've been talking about. It may not surprise you to learn that, on average, both men and women underperformed a buy and hold uh, strategy. But what was relevant to our hypothesis is that men underperform by about one percentage point more a year than women, single men by 1.4 percentage points more a year than single women. All right. Another behavior that, that is um, quite widespread is that people, investors, hold on to their losing investments. And they tend to sell their winners. There are different ways to explain this, but what, what I think is going on is basically people are postponing regret. When you sell something for a gain, you get that feeling of good. I did something right. When you sell for a loss, you feel bad. Mostly people prefer to feel good. 
and so they postpone. In any case, there's a strong effect. Now, I'm going to put up um, here. This is from Taiwan. Originally, part of my dissertation was the study of US investors. I showed that US investors had this tendency. I put up Taiwan uh, because in this study, we have all the trading records for every single investor in Taiwan over a five-year period, individuals and institutions. And so we're able to sort of see how prevalent this was. Now, what does a four mean here? The four basically means that if an individual investor in Taiwan went to bed last night owning one stock that was held for a gain and one that was held for a loss, he's four times as likely to sell the winner today as the loser. So it was a very strong, that's a stronger disposition effect that I found than I found with individual investors in the US. But it was widespread. The foreign, the foreign investors are all institutions. So the foreign institutional investors didn't display that. And the mutual funds didn't display that effect. Although there has been studies that I didn't do, but other people here, uh, academics in the US, have found uh, some evidence of a disposition effect for mutual funds. OK. Now, I got asked, sir, did you ask me if there'd be a quiz? Someone, oh no. Um, one of your associates asked if there's going to be a quiz. Not exactly, but I want you to pay attention, OK? <laughs> there's going to be sort of a quiz. I'm about to show you a video. And if, if you've seen it already or a version of it, just watch, see what you see. Um, there are going to be six, I think they're young women, passing basketballs. Three of them have white shirts on. Three of them, watch, this is a little different than what you see. But three of them have black shirts on. You're going to count how many times the white team passes a basketball. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, come on, I can count. I'm going to make it difficult because while you're counting, I'm going to count loudly backwards from 100 to make it tougher. Okay? So, are you ready? And that's the quiz. The only quiz in there. I thought like I probably should have done a quiz. I didn't realize it would be a classroom setting. It would feel great right to have a quiz. All right. So, are you ready? 100, 99, 98, 97, 96. 95, 94, 93, 92, 91, 90, 89, 88, 87, 86, 85, 84, 83, 82, 81, 80, 79, 78, 77, 76, 75, 74, 73, 72. All right. Did you know, I know you saw <coughs> You saw what you saw, but did you, for example, notice that one of the black players walked, if black t-shirt players walked off yeah. in the middle of the, in the middle of it? Who's still stuff? Um, <laughs> how many of you who've not seen that, didn't see an, in the video before, uh, didn't see anything unusual? Did you see anything unusual? Nothing unusual. No. But I was did you see? The yeah, well, you did. did. Well, I mean, for example, did you see a gorilla walk across the street? <laughs> How many gorillas? None. None. Did you see a gorilla walk across the street? Did you? Yeah. No. Yes. Can we watch this again? Sure. Okay. How many did not see a gorilla walk across the stage? You might as well be honest. Okay. And how many thought they saw a gorilla walk across the stage? Well, okay. Then I guess we're going to have to see. And meanwhile, how many of you have seen a version of this before? Okay. That's, yeah, all of you guys. So, for those who've seen it before, you've probably not seen this particular version, right? You saw one similar. Here's a couple things you might not have noticed which is the color of the curtains change. And one of the black players just walks off the court. So even though you thought, oh, I'm clever. I've seen this before. I'm going to see the gorilla this time. There's other stuff going on. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get this to play again. That wasn't um, What's that? That wasn't the task. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I've never counted it. <laughs> 16. All right. We just lost one of the black uh, t-shirt players, and the curtain just changed colors. You see it this time? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, 
wasn't there in the first. <laughs> 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 that is the same thing. That is the same thing. It wasn't in your mind. <laughs> I asked you to count the basketballs being passed. Yeah, so <coughs> or gorillas. <laughs> Gorilla. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to think that if you were doing one thing, say driving carefully in a gorilla, would... <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Obviously, if people, if everyone saw the gorilla, I wouldn't be showing this. Right? Um, thanks to Daniel uh, Simmons, by the way, for this uh, interesting research. So here's why I, I, I show this. I'm interested in attention and how attention affects investor behavior. And you know, we have, we have a limited amount of attention. You pay attention to one thing. If you really pay attention to one thing, basically don't pay as much attention to other things. It's a limited resource. And my friend, and you know, called her Brad Barber, and I asked the question, we said, okay. What happens when an individual investor wants to buy a stock? <clears throat> How do you choose? There are, like in the US, there are 8,000 know, stocks. There are 500 in the S&P 500. There are 5,000 in the Wilshire 5,000. There, there are so many stocks. How do you decide which one you want? What we think happens is this. We think that most investors, they don't go out and search through all the stocks. Most investors wait for a stock to catch their attention, and then they ask themselves, do I like it or do I not like it? Um, so for example, suppose you have two investors, Michael and myself. And you know, Michael is a Graham and Dodd style investor. He's at the Ivy School. And let's just say I'm a momentum investor. So on a particular day, there are 10 attention-grabbing stocks. I'll talk about attention-grabbing in a moment. Let's just say they're, you know, they're, they're mentioned in the Wall Street Journal, and we both read the journal, at least the front page. Uh, and Michael looks at these 10, and he finds you know, a stock that is kind of an out of favor, but has sound fundamentals. And if he likes it, it appeals to him, he buys it. I, f I look at the same 10, and I find a stock that has had positive earning surprises for the last three quarters. And I think what goes up goes up. So I, I, I buy that. So we have different preferences. But attention takes the choice set from like 5,000 down to a, a dozen or 10. And then our preferences and our beliefs enter in. So for, for multi-dimensional uh, decisions where there's a lot to be considered, or there are a lot, of, a lot of dimensions to consider or a lot of choices. Attention might have more of an influence on your decision than your beliefs or your preferences. So we postulate this. So Brad Barber and I said, OK, if this is true, and individual investors have limited attention, it's going to affect what they buy. But it won't affect what they sell so much. And there's a simple reason for this. In, the, in our data sets, investors tend to own four or five stocks. And, if you want, and they don't sell short which is good. They only sell things they own, which is, there are a few exceptions. But for the most part, they only sell the stocks they own. So if you only own five stocks and you want to sell something, you can consider. It's not that hard to say, do I want to sell A, B, C, D, or B? So attention, it's not that it doesn't matter at all, but it matters much less on the sell side than on the buy side. And attention matters less for institutional investors because they have more of it. They're not trading between coming home from work and having their first, or maybe after having their first cocktail. You know, they're at work all day. They're more likely to use computers. They work in teams. And also, the choice set from which they sell is much larger. Um, so we figured attention was going to lead to individual investors being on the buy side of the market for stocks that have a lot of attention. And we used a couple proxies for attention. And there's been a lot of follow-up work. Uh, using other proxies. But we used abnormal trading volume. We said if a stock is trading more than it usually does, people must be paying attention to it. We used extreme returns on the previous day. We said if a stock went up a lot or down a lot yesterday, people were probably paying attention to it. And we looked at whether it was in the news. And there have been subsequent studies sort of confirming what we found using Google search index and using a wide variety and actually a lot of clever um, I, 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 ways of measuring attention. So um, our prediction was this. This is from a little theoretical model. This is sorting on trading volume. And the vertical axis 
is the percentage of uh, what we call order of balance. The number of purchases minus the number of sales over purchases plus sales. Or people on the buy side of the market. So this was our theoretical prediction. We had three databases of actual investor trading records. We had uh, 60 some thousand, 67 thousand investors at a large discount brokerage firm, 670 thousand investors at a large retail firm, and a small discount firm with about 14,500 investors. And in all cases, the more, the higher the abnormal trading volume, the greater the tendency for individuals to be on the buy side. And later we went back and, and used uh, a little more technical method by looking at trade-by-trade uh, -trade data. And um, I, I'm not going to exactly explain. We basically use small trades as a proxy for individual investors. And we get the same pattern. The only thing that happens when we add, we use 18 years of data and millions of trades is the pattern gets smoother and smoother. Uh, our theoretical prediction in a very simple model was yesterday's big winners and big losers were going to be the stocks individuals were buying. That's the prediction. Um, this is what we find when we look at, at actual trading records of individual investors. And here's what we look, find when we look at the transactional data. So it's a pretty strong effect. Individual investors are being swayed by their tension. Now there's other research on tension, which I didn't do. Uh, but I find quite interesting, which is the opposite side. Like, I'm, I'm looking at what happens when somebody grabs your attention. And there are papers that look at what happens when there's too much other stuff going on and you should be paying attention to something. And many of these focus on earnings announcements. And they find that the market as a whole underreacts to earnings announcements when there are a lot of announcements on the same day or when the announcements come out like on a Friday afternoon and you're thinking about what you would do for the weekend, or when there are other things going on that grab, grab your attention. All right. Um, now, the biggest <coughs> bias, I think, for individual investors is that they chase performance. I did one, there are so many studies. We by no means did the first study on this, but one study we looked at people at the discount brokerage firm and we looked at new money going into mutual funds and 39% of it went into the funds that were in the top decile of performance the year before. Over half the money went into funds that were in the top 20%. And yet, and oh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, it, it just the same sort of thing. It, it just shows that the fund, that people are chasing performance and there's no reason to do so. <coughs> that funds, uh, but this, uh, this is something that I think is a little interesting. This is uh, Troy Lapson and Major into this study. And what did they do? They got a bunch of Harvard staff and then Wharton MBAs and some Harvard MBAs. And they asked them to choose which of four S&P 500 index funds they would invest a hypothetical $10,000 in for a year if they could do so. And they actually set this up where if you made a choice, if you made a choice and it would have made money, they paid you that amount. It turns out some of the people could have earned a little more than $300 if they made the right choice. Uh, they had a lot of money from this. Um, and so what's the difference? These are all S&P 500 index funds. And they gave them information from the prospectus. Uh, so what are some of the differences? Well, most notably, you've got, I want you to look at two of these. Allergent, which it's the longest, uh, longest rise in return in the prospectus was 3.8% a year. And the Phoenix Fund, its longest horizon return was 7.34%. These are both S&P 500 index funds. Why would they have a different, different return? Sorry, to clarify the question. These are all identical funds except for their fees. They started yes. different times. These are all identical funds except for their fees. And they, right, so they, said, they started out at different times, or some of them were reporting different horizons. Mm -hmm. Some of them reported a 10-year horizon, some reported since the inception. So they all earn the same underlying return within a basis point or two, and they charge different fees. 
So which one should you buy? Lowest fee. What's the lowest fee? You should buy the lowest fee. Which ones did people buy? The ones with the highest history on the piece of paper in front of them. That one with the highest, right. So there are the, the difference in fees, and they chose these funds in this way. So allergens and fees over a one-year horizon for $10,000 were less than half of those of the Phoenix. But where did the money go? Mostly into the Phoenix. Real money at stake, smart people. Harvard staff, Wharton MBAs, some Harvard MBAs. Um, so it, it's just, it just drives home how strong this tendency to chase performance is and how one piece of information often drives out <coughs> thinking about others. People get focused on one thing. So why are we this way? Well, let me th I'm going to take a little side trick here. Who's that? Beijing. Who's that? Hussein Bolt. Bolt. London. <laughs> no, I should just ask, where are we? It's still the same as Anderson. When it comes to running the 100 meter dash, there's a lot of persistence in performance. Right? I mean, it's not guaranteed he'll win every time. In fact, he actually managed to lose a race. But there's a lot of persistence. Now, what about this? Here is a roulette table. This guy back here has a lot of chips. Do you think he's a really good roulette player? Would you expect him to win tomorrow and next week? No. OK. So um, you know, what's going on here? You know, you've got, we know that people who race, runners, there's persistence. Gamblers, there, there's not so much. OK, I want, to, I want to work in a short story. This was, I thought I'd be about halfway in. I'll start talking faster. But this is the part where I was going to wake you up with the story. And this is a hypothetical story, which means it never really happened about Michael and me. And it's a hypothetical story about the time that Michael and I went to the Amazon rainforest. And we're adventurous. Well, you know, he's an adventurous soul. We, we went to the Amazon rainforest. We were a bit too adventurous. We got separated from our group. They'd gone up the river on a boat. We had this walkie-talkie radio thing. And the group leader said, I'll pick you bozos up tomorrow morning on the way back down the river. So we were fine. We had water, water filters, but we didn't have any, any food. And we looked around ourselves, and I'm hoping. We looked around ourselves and you know, didn't recognize anything. And I ate some of these leafy things, and Michael ate some of these dark leaf plants. And I don't know if he knows more about botany than me or if he's just lucky. But I got very sick, and he didn't. Well, the next morning, I'm feeling better. I got my appetite back. What do I eat, and what don't I eat? Why don't I eat the thing that made me sick the day before, right? OK. A couple weeks later, we're back in the States. We actually had fun. We want to go celebrate. Where do we go? Come on. Where do kids, where do grown-ups go to celebrate in the US? We go to Las Vegas. <laughs> yes. And there he is with the money. And we go right up to the roulette wheel. I, Michael puts his money on the red. I put my money on the black. The little wheel spins. Come on, little wheel. There it is. The little wheel spins and it lands on the uh, on the red. He wins, I lose. Okay, so we've had two situations where Michael made one choice, I made a different choice. His worked out well, mine didn't. But in one case, it affected my future behavior. You know, I'm not going to eat the thing that made me sick day before. In the other case, I actually wouldn't. I'm not going to think, oh, the red is the way to go. Right? Where the little wheel lands one time doesn't tell you about the other. So little things, I think what's going on is I'm learning. And I'm learning by observation. But I'm also I'm 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 also doing some deductive learning. I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, one of these is a deterministic event and one of them is chance. Right? And so that that and this is a question that really turns up. It, it's a fundamental question for investors. <coughs> and the question is sort of like this. Are, is the market more like runners, or is it more like roulette players? It, how random is the market? And you can think about that in terms of your own investing, or if you're hiring money, money managers, do you expect money managers to persist? like Hussein Bolt, or do you expect them to, you know, be more like roulette players? Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. 
And what I think is that investors overestimate how deterministic the market is. And I don't think it's completely random. I really don't. But I think investors, they look for patterns. They think they're going to find patterns. And I think this is built into our psychology. And, you know, evolutionary psychologists sometimes say that, that some of our, our psychological makeup came from hunter-gatherer times, although undoubtedly a lot of it preceded that. But let me tell you a little hunter-gatherer story. Suppose there are two hunters, and they go out hunting one day, and they're about to go around a big boulder. They hear a roar. One of the hunters goes around the boulder, and there's a tiger there, and the tiger kills him. Our surviving hunter you know, runs away, gets home. He's going out hunting. He is going out hunting again. And uh, this time, he's out by himself. Alas, he's alone. He's about to go around the boulder. He hears a roar, and he says to himself, roar, tiger, and he turns and runs. Well, I know the statisticians in the room are thinking, come on. Everyone knows a sample of one is not statistically significant. <laughs> he should have tested the hypothesis. <laughs> but no, <laughs> but no, he turned and ran. Okay. Now, a couple weeks later, our, our hero is going hunting. The day before, he snared a rabbit. Uh, he ate the rabbit, but as the rabbit's leg was left, he takes it in his little hunter's lunchbox, goes out. He's got a great day. He kills an antelope, drags it back into camp, and you know everyone's happy. All that's left of the rabbit's leg now is the rabbit's foot. He says to himself, this is my lucky rabbit's foot. It brings me luck when I hunt. Puts on leather thong, hangs it around his neck. Well, now you're thinking, whoa, well, well, this is a spurious correlation. This is superstition. But what's the downside? It weighs a couple of ounces. He burns off the odd calorie wearing it. He's mildly attractive, like how the planet made. The downside wasn't so bad. We, we developed, in this, I, I, I believe, in, in, in an environment where it was better to err on the side of seeing a few patterns that might not be real. Unfortunately for investors, it gets very expensive to start trading on patterns that aren't there. Well, how expensive? Well, this comes to why does it matter? As I mentioned, we have data on every trade by every investor in Taiwan over a five-year period. Actually, now we have 16 years. But this study I'm going to show you is from five years. And we calculated <coughs> what the individual investors were making or losing as a group through their trading activities. And what do we find? We found that individuals, their gross trading profits, I'll put these in terms you you're more familiar with in a moment. They were 178, they lost 178 million new Taiwanese dollars a day. It's about 30 new Taiwanese dollars to the US dollar during this period. To gross trading profits, they also lost money through market timing. They paid a lot in commissions and they paid transactions taxes. Taiwan had a 30 basis point transaction tax. The individuals in this market accounted for 89% of the trades during our time period which is why they end up paying a lot more in commissions than the institutions, because even when they trade with each other, they pay a lot of commissions. What did this add up to? Uh, it was about 2%, 2.2% of GDP, if you look at the cost of trading to these people. Uh, it reduced the aggregate um, portfolio performance of individual investors by about 3.8 percentage points a year, which is large. That's like the typical cut that mutual funds and financial advisors take in Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the institutions made money before fees. That doesn't mean they didn't charge their clients that much, but they were coming out ahead. And in this time period, and things have changed, but um, the 42% of the individual's gross daily losses were to foreign institutional investors who were making about $3.5 million a day by coming to Taiwan. How is the US different? A um, couple of things. US investors trade much less actively. So they eat up a lot less in commissions. Also, commissions have come down. So that's, that's definitely a change. On the other side, though, these the, Individuals in Taiwan, when they placed a trade, for the most part, like 90% of the time, they were trading with another individual. When a US investor, probably a Canadian one too, places a trade, odds are the counterparty to that trade, the person on the other side of that trade, 
is an institutional investor who has an informational advantage. Um, all right, I got it. We're going to wrap this up quickly. I'm just going to ask a question. If individuals, if the stocks they buy go on to underperform the ones they sell, what should you do? But here's one idea. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> yes. I will do the opposite. Okay. This is the uh, episode in which George decides to do the opposite and everything goes great. It's not what I'm recommending. Instead of saying individuals should just always do the opposite of what they feel like doing, I'm just going to go kind of conservative here and say invest for the long run, buy and hold, diversify, keep your investment costs down and pay attention to taxes. It's, um, it's probably a boring approach, but it works. Uh, I'm going to skip the last thing. Briefly, I'm just going, I want to make the point that a lot of financial services companies use complexity in a way that is not in the best interest of uh, their customers. And what I won't go through in detail was a friend of mine asked me for advice about his um, portfolio <coughs> in a comparable large uh, brokerage firm in the US. And he's a musician and he was confused. He said, every year I have to talk to these people. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to ask. He said, send me a copy of your portfolio. This is it. It's crazy. He has commodities. He's got bonds. He's got ETFs. He's got actively managed mutual funds. He's got closed-end mutual funds. He's got bond funds. He's being charged a 1.5% management fee. I found funds in there with one, in, uh, one point, the highest I think was 1.3% annual expense ratio. I even found in here, uh, not, let's skip that one and move on to, I found a tax-managed fund in his tax-deferred account. Um, why? I think basically, this is being made so complex that he thinks the people advising me are geniuses. I could never do this on my own. He's now with Vanguard. Uh, but you know, I just said, look, you don't, I thought he was being charged way too much in fees. Um, and he was being confused. Now finally, I was in New York today. Uh, and it's, um, it's fun for me because of that, I should tell you, now, I, I was in Norway a couple of years ago, and they have a piece of advice in Norway saying, which is when cab drivers start giving you financial advice, you should watch out. Well, it turns out 47 years ago, I was a, yeah, 1970, I was a um, New York cab driver. <laughs> so um, they get your advice kind of from the wrong place. Uh, I know I got, went through things quickly. All the research I've talked about, or all mine, is on my website. And as Michael Heinle mentioned, I have links to about 50 videos on personal finance topics about investing and things like that uh, for the general public. Um, and I have time for a few questions if anyone's interested. You know, if you, uh, if you don't mind waiting for the mic, sorry. Thank you. You don't talk about the asymmetry between uh, people's greed and fear. We're wired more for fear than for greed. Are we? <laughs> so I'm told. Okay. It, it my fits friend, with my anecdotal observation. Yeah. My friend, um, Chris Sheffern, actually has written a book called Fear and Greed. He's a, he does work in behavioral finance, and you might, which you might find interesting. It's not what I've done research with. Okay. Um, I've looked, I do think that one of, one of the challenges for investors and probably the best argument for getting financial advice, not necessarily at any price, but getting financial advice, is to avoid making decisions in, uh, to avoid making decisions when the market is either plummeting or going up. You don't want to make your decisions uh, like in March of 2009, nor do you want to make your decisions like in the fall of 1999. So actually, uh, 
I have a friend who is a retired art school teacher here in Toronto. And I believe that she was the last person to buy into the dot-com bubble. She owned, she told me later, after this was all over, she owned Canadian mutual funds. And she had a friend who was, had been an art teacher in the States. They both taught at colleges. Uh, who was making a bunch of money in high-tech stocks. And eventually, my friend couldn't stand it anymore. And she <coughs> called up the broker. She sold all her mutual funds and bought a bunch of US high-tech stocks. And that probably signaled the end of the, um, of the bubble. Because you can't expand the bubble unless you bring in new buyers. Um, so it's an issue. Fear and greed, I don't know. I think fear, you know, we can't really study fear. I did a study. I'll tell you about a study I did that's related to this. But it, <coughs> we, we, there, are, there are protocols by which you can run uh, experimental markets. Students come into a room, they sit at a computer, you endow them with some stocks and some cash, they trade with each other, the stock pays dividends, after about a half hour it's all over, you give them some money and they leave. Um, and now I don't want to trivialize this because a, a friend of both Amos's and mine, uh, Vernon Smith, won the Nobel Prize in part for work like this. He did other stuff, but for experimental uh, economic, experimental finance. And I did one, I've run one experimental study, I've written one experimental study, and we did basically, we copied what Vernon had done, and the one twist we did is we showed people videos before, and we had a story, which was basically true, that we were asking them to rate the videos that were going to be used in subsequent experiments. And some people watched an exciting video for five minutes, and in other settings, people watched a boring documentary for five minutes. And we got much bigger bubbles when people were excited. So I do think excitement helps fuel uh, bubbles, whether it's, you know, greed is a harsh word. Um, you could say my friend was greedy, she was envious, but she was also doing sort of what is human. You see someone else doing something that's successful in an area where you don't know much, and you think I should do what they're doing. And the fear, yeah, I, I think there's reason. You know, March of 2009, you don't really know what's happening to the world economy. There's some reason for fear. I didn't sell anything, but I did lose some sleep. <coughs> my, yeah. my background is medicine and science. My husband's a financial worker. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> but, you know, when you talk about um, being informed, how informed is informed, for example, to what extent do the normal variables affect your judgment? All right. What I think is, since you're married to a financial genius, yeah, then you don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Most investors should probably not be involved in trying to guess what's going to happen next with the global economy, which is going to be simply, you're thinking, yeah, but you can make a lot of money doing it. They're mostly going to get it wrong. We looked in Taiwan, the individual investors, their market timing was perverse. When they put more money as a group into the market, over the next six months, the market did less well. When they took money out, the market did better. Even though market timing, I think most, or at least many uh, professionals would say, market timing is very difficult, but it's possible. The fact that it's possible means it's possible to get it wrong. And I think a lot of individuals get it wrong. Personally, I think at this point, and it depends on the environment, but in the current environment, I think most individuals who maybe didn't go to the Ivy School and study finance or aren't professionals, most individuals should be buying broad-based index funds with very low fees. And they should pay attention to fees, which are for sure. Fees are certain. And the fees add up. I've got to, I, I went, ran through it, but if you, the difference between earning 1% or 2% a year over two or three decades is huge. So if you've got a combination of financial advisor <coughs> and a mutual fund company that's raking 2% off the top, even if they're doing a fine job of investing, it, it's going to hurt you. So, I would rather see investors get informed about sound practices but not try to 
figure out what Brexit means for the world economy. Um, over here, right here. Hi. Hi, no worries. Uh, the Taiwanese data is incredible because it really makes it come alive. What's the backdrop to how you got all that data, and are there other jurisdictions that are going after that same kind of data? I'd love to see that for Canada. I would too. How do we get it? That's what I was going to ask you. You don't run a brokerage firm, do you? No. No. <laughs> it's sad. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a reasonable question. Chuck, oh, we have a Chuck, actually, the Chuck can talk about it because he got the data I, for the study. For the study. Yeah. Do I want to talk about it? Yeah. Well, how do you go about getting this kind of data? Coincidentally, we have that data. It's a little different. It's mutual fund trades rather than securities. So we have data from 2000 to 2013, two and a half million Canadians, and down to the transaction level. And the, the results of that research uh, were published journal finance uh, last month. And they talked to bias. Yeah. In, in the so how I got, I'll tell you a story how Can I, I just respond to that for a second? I'd love to hear your response. But you, you've got to extend that to ETFs and individual stocks. In 2000, we didn't have a lot of ETFs. <coughs> but are you doing that now? Are you starting to collect data on broader investment types? We absolutely can. Because to your point about what this woman should do with her, you know, get a low-cost ETF portfolio, <coughs> sorry, but she'll just blow herself up with that. No, no, she, not, not if she gets, so, because you know, this is a limited talk. Here. When I talk to my students about ETFs, and in fact, if you watch one of my videos on, on mutual funds, I talk about ETFs, I'm quite clear that not all ETFs are created equal. If you go to, if you, if you buy an S&P 500 ETF with a you know, 10 basis or six basis management fee, fine. But you can also buy things that are labeled ETFs that are pure gambles. And the example I use in, in one of my videos is something called Dust, which is leveraged three to one on the daily returns of gold mining companies. And you can either bet three to one in favor of their daily returns or three to one against. That's that's just pure speculation. So I I tell my students, I say, I don't care if you buy an open-end mutual fund or an ETF, I care about diversification and fees. <coughs> and They're behavior. Little, well, behavior I when Donald Trump got elected, a lot of people wanted out of the United States. You, yeah, well they sold their S&P <laughs> five hundred stock indexes. And the houses? Yeah. There's a question um, over on the, on the left hand side there. The Taiwanese stuff, but I'd be interested in that. Okay, afterwards. so basically, I get into I spent a long time getting my original data sets. I spent the better part of a year ask. I, I contacted, I almost got data from, um, was it Greenline? Was it Party Greenline? Yeah, I, I came this close, and I was talking to the uh, executive assistant to the CEO. And she said to me, I forget his name, had approved that subject to legal, gain approval from legal. <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah. Um, yeah, I did a lot of stuff. I, it was very hard. The Taiwanese data basically, it, sometimes success eventually breeds success. So I had published these papers. My Taiwanese co authors got in touch with me and they said, We got this data. Okay. Um, and would you be interested in working with us? So I said, Yes. This has been great. I guess my question is is on the buy and hold. Have you done anything or is there any body of work or research around like um, situations under duress? Because I think that is the big thing. It's easy to be buy and hold when the markets are like, yeah, you know, I, I fine and all that, right? So how, how do we protect ourselves on that one there? Because that's the thing that concerns me. And I know sure. I read rid holds and all that. They'll say that's what you got to mentally prepare yourself for. Well, how, right? Can I, pull like, out, I think I pulled out this stuff on... I wonder if I can. Yeah, I, so the topic of bringing up is one that I was um, going to talk about, and I decided uh, not to because of time. But let's see. Um, let me just show you. I, I briefly talk about this. <laughs> All right, so what I was going to talk about is sometimes the market is a bit like a roller coaster, right? And, you know, it can be exhilarating in both directions, and people make a lot of mistakes under duress. 
and it's not, you know, sometimes, sometimes people ask this hypothetical question of, of investors. They say, well, you know, if, if you, if, if given your portfolio, if the market were down 30%, what would you do? <coughs> the implication in that question is the market's down 30% and that's it. And then you say, why well, hold on? But what if the market was down 30% and you don't have a clue what's going to happen? And you turn on the radio and, and one guy is saying, there's a television, one guy is saying this is the opportunity, buying opportunity of lifetime, and someone else saying where it's all going down, it's the end of the world. Um, so my suggestion is you make a plan in, in calm times. You stick to it. I know that's not easy. You try to put yourself in the position. You say, okay, what if things were like March of 2009? What if I didn't know what was going on? Would I be able to stick to this? And if you really think you couldn't, then adjust. you adjust now. Yeah. Um, oh, but anyway, yeah. So I was going to talk. I did talk about it. <laughs> there you go. So we're on that side in the back. Did you have a question? No, no. No, okay. Um, down front here. So do you see a difference in behavior when you look at portfolio managers that are average or ones that are in like the top 5% of performance? <coughs> You have something in mind, and when you say top 5%, you mean yesterday, last year, or next year? Like over, <laughs> over the long term. I'll tell you my over the long term story. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody know who Bill Miller is? Yeah. 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 Last time I was not mildly intoxicated, but legally drunk, <laughs> Bill was buying. It was 2007, and we were in Santa Fe. I got invited to a conference at the Santa Fe Institute, and he was the chairman of the board at the time. And we'd known each other for some years, because he was very interested in behavioral finance. I'd given a talk for Lake Mason in Las Vegas, which is where I got the idea to use Las Vegas. Bill Miller had beaten the S&P 500 14 or 15 years or something like that, maybe even more. He just had this incredible record for a guy running a big fund. I'm sitting at lunch with him nursing my hangover um, and thinking to myself, gosh, he's the real deal. And I thought, okay, I only own index funds and it's because occasionally, and I'll tell you, I don't get asked very often, but occasionally someone from the press will say or someone in a situation like this will say, well, what do you own? You're preaching index funds, what do you own? I like to be able to honestly say, I own index funds. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, but I really know Bill. He's got a PhD in philosophy. He's thoughtful. He's smart. I mean, and I thought about investing in his fund. I decided not to simply, really in part, because I thought I should practice what I preach. Bill lost, uh, he lost one and a half times what the market lost. So I think he lost about 50 or 60% in the time the market was down around 40%. He had always had highly concentrated positions. He just always picked the right side. But he was heavily uh, into financial firms, and he was heavily into casinos. And they both got clobbered during the financial crisis. So I don't really know what, you know, when you say the successful ones, I know who's been successful. I don't know who will be successful. I can tell you. I'll tell you this. Now, Bill was, Bill was also, he was not arrogant. Now, yeah, I really like the guy, and he's done much better again the last few years. But um, I have a paper called Learning to be Overconfident. And it's based on observations from the psychology literature that when people are successful at something, they tend to take credit for the success. And when they fail, they blame bad luck and other people. And we say, well, what if investors do this? And we say, well, that means successful investors will become overconfident. And we even show that in our model, the younger someone is, the earlier in their experience this happens, the more overconfident they get. So I, for one, would never hire, give my money to a young hedge fund manager who had only seen success in his life. Because almost certainly, that guy thinks he's a genius. Um, so I worry, I don't think it's a world of Hussein Bolts out there when it comes to money managers. I think there is skill, it's very hard. Uh, someone asked me earlier who my dissertation chair had been, 
this guy named Mark Rubenstein who did not do behavioral finance. He was a financial engineer. I saw him once give a talk at a financial engineering conference, and he said it takes 25 years to know whether a mutual fund manager has skill or not, which is pretty much the career of a mutual fund manager. All right, thank you. So I tried to pay really close attention, but my attention was wandering. <laughs> so I was thinking about you know that that attention problem and the last talk I bought. The uh, very hard to do without a plan, and I think that's what Terry's uh, sort of mission is: is to try and help us not be our own worst enemy. So uh, it's been great to have you here. Uh, you can get a lot of Terry's uh, videos and, and share them with your friends. I mean, really, it, it's worthwhile to go. They're very short. They're, they're very funny. It's uh, uh, hard to find, my wife tells me. <coughs> if you go to my website, there's a link that goes to all of them. The one thing I did think that we could give you other than financial advice was uh, a water bottle to bring back with you. To, uh, <laughs> to, uh, it's, you're a swell guy. This is a swell <laughs> guy. Thank you so much. So, uh, Please look for more events like this. Uh, we send them out through our the Ivy website. Uh, we obviously will be doing this uh, again in a year's time, but in the meantime, we'll be doing a, a, a various events. Um, we'll be doing a robo advice conference in, in April. We're doing uh, other kind of speaking events. In front of you, you will see a um, an evaluation form. It would be very helpful if you could give us your thoughts on this one. I know it was excellent, but also to give an idea of what kind of events you'd like to see in the future. And uh, thank you to Terry. I think we're we're gonna have a few minutes after we end here. If you'd like to come down and say hello, and uh, but otherwise we look forward to hosting you at a future event. Thank you very much. Thank you.